attendee. <laughs> Thank you for saying hello, Doug. All right. Hi, everyone. We're going to, it looks like people are still um, logging in, but I'm going to go ahead and get started. So here we are for our July Affiliate Connections call. And uh, it's wonderful that so many people are joining us today. We actually have a special treat for you. And um, I'm Lynn Kenny. I'm the Director of Industry Relations. I've been with the Center for almost four years. And um, we also have Jill Glazier here, my partner in crime, and Barbara Hewlett. So together, we're going to be bringing you today's Affiliate Connections call. So here is our introduction. So we're, we're going to go over a couple of things, um, more housekeeping things. So I see that most of you have already put yourselves on mute, and I thank you that helps us to get rid of the background noise. If you feel like putting your video on, I'm sure that everyone that's on this, this call, you all know each other. You're all part of this, you know, wonderful small community. Hey, Francis. And um, I love seeing your faces. I love seeing all of these healthy faces. I feel like that's such a blessing in today's world. And um, we have such a treat because today we have Barbara Hewlett joining us to share um, her Ebola treatment module, an infection prevention treatment module. Then we'll go through some Q&A and share some resources. So as far as the housekeeping part of it, um, you know, stay on mute. And if you feel like sharing your camera, please do. And if your audio isn't working well, you can always call in using your phone. I feel like some of these housekeeping things, all of us are spending our entire days on uh, Zoom and Microsoft meetings now. So I feel like this is old hat for everybody. Uh, there is a way, there is this little icon that you can use. Uh, so you can play around with that. You can use the chat function and Jill will be monitoring the chat if you have questions throughout the presentation. You, you'll see these little icons where, um, and the slide that's up now gives you a good indication of that. You can look at this side by side and that makes it a little easier um, to view everybody's face on the right hand column and then she view the presentation slide larger in the middle of your screen. If you have colleagues that you think would be interested in um, viewing this presentation, or if you want to go back and look at some of our, our archived affiliate connection calls, you can find that as well as links to all of your member benefits on the affiliate members only page. And that's what this image is showing you. So you go to the main website about us and then met about our members. And then on the right hand side here, you see um, affiliate members only. So that, that page is such a great resource. So um, Barbara um, with Hewlett Davis and Hewlett Healing Design was one of the center's EDAC advocate firms. And our EDAC advocates are firms that um, commit to having at least 25% of their healthcare team get EDAC certified, which is widely recognized in our industry and really demonstrates a commitment to evidence-based design. And so once a year, the EDAC advocate firms submit one of their projects. And I love this brochure, this, this brochure that we publish every year. The center distributes it, it's on our website. We distribute it at all the events that we go to and it really brings the evidence-based design process to life. Um, because what you'll see here is, you know, Barbara submitted this. She talks about the goal of her project. She'll go into that in a little more detail in a moment. And she talks about the evidence-based design steps that were applied and then the results. So um, you can ask, excuse me, you can email me if you can't find it on our website and I'll send you the link. But we do this every year and it's just a wonderful resource. Okay. So without further ado, I'm going to do a quick, it, it's, it's going to be challenging to do a quick intro for Barbara is very challenging because she has so many wonderful accomplishments. So let me bring up her bio. Hold on a minute. Don't fail me now, technology. Okay, so this year, um, Barbara was, 
she earned and was awarded the, she was the ASID award recipient for innovation. Huge honor and really uh, well-deserved. So that's a huge accomplishment, but that is one of many. Um, Barbara is an author. She's an interior designer and a healing design strategist. Her problem-solving philosophy, which is human-centric design, uh, and her passion to improve the lives of humanity through better design. Over the past 43 years, her work has contributed to the discovery, the definition, and the communication of healing environments. By placing humanity at the core, her pioneering mindset proves that human-centric designs impact healing and improve the human experience and affect outcomes, health outcomes, and can be cost-effective. Her quest to support human health has led to extensive research. She has written two books, both establishing the impacts of evidence-based design. Her books are used by students and designers and architects and healthcare providers, and they're required by AAHID's exam. Her second book has been translated into Chinese and is used throughout both China and the Southeast. So Barbara, thank you for joining us today. I'm gonna to turn it over to you to share your uh, project and I'll bring up your slides. Okay, Barbara Hewlett, everyone. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and, and thanks for joining this afternoon. I, I'm so happy to share uh, this project, although it's a, it's a few years old, it seems so t timely today. Um, this is a, a project for, for Ebola. It was designed in um, 2014 for um, Ebola treatment when it was raging our country. Okay. Next slide. So Ebola dominated the, the press kind of like COVID does today. And um, our first case in the United States was in October of 2014. And CDC felt that one death or one illness um, to this disease was too many. Um, the, okay. Next slide. So Ebola virus is transmitted from the uh, fruit bat to an animal. The animal is then um, eaten or infected um, and transferred to humans and, who eat it or have become infected by this. And we all know that Ebola was quite deadly and, um, and contagious somewhat different than what we're dealing with today. Not quite as contagious, but uh, far more deadly than uh, the COVID. Okay. So these are some of the environments in which Ebola was um, treated in 2014. It originated in the, some of the African countries, but as our, our global um, cultures spread the disease, around the globe and uh, uh, to the United States. In the United States, we had um, designated hospitals that uh, set up treatment in, in their sometimes parking lot and sometimes dedicated wings for treating Ebola. Okay, next slide. The next slide shows um, our typical treatment modular that was used in the United States. And um, so we were approached by a manufacturer uh, of solid surface materials to design a prototype for this module. Okay, thank you. Next slide. So we were asked to design one based on our ER1 philosophy. That was a number of years ago, but it was, it was unusual in that we designed it um, totally to um, mitigate bacteria and, um, and pathogens. So a lot of, we learned a great deal from that project and the philosophy it was also, um, there were three pebble projects that came out of that one. Um, so in this project, the Ebola capsule, we were asked um, to design an exam treatment area, an anteroom, a toilet, 
and it was to be uh, safe and highly cleanable. And one of the biggest issues of Ebola was the waste, that the bodily waste, because that in itself was an extreme contaminant um, where many people uh, got the disease from. So it also had to have integrated utilities and it was just a, kind of a plug and play a module that it could be brought anywhere and plugged in, assembled and plugged in. Um, it was had to be designed to fit in container ships and, and on a flatbed trailer so it could be moved about around the country rather quickly. And it was to be a prototype um, and uh, where they could uh, mass produce these and get them to the, 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 the hot site of the time. Okay, next slide. So when I mentioned it was our ER1 philosophy, uh, we had spent a great deal of time with investigation on how to, how to mitigate pathogens. Uh, this was one of our prime concern because at the time we were dealing with anthrax and terrorism and um, uh, and so we were the ER1 and its three subsequent projects were really designed to uh, mitigate uh, the pathogens and to be ultra flexible so it could flex on any need and very important is human centric and the human centric piece of this was um, very important because often as designers and architects we focus on the space the place and not about the human interaction which is just as critical for healing as the space and the place so the human centric um, element was a major component of our study with ER1 and subsequently became a major part of our study for the Ebola capsule. Okay, next slide. So the project goals that, you know, similar in the brochure um, is the, you know, that meticulous infection control. It had to be safe for the caregivers and the patient and the people that maintained it. And it, so, and then not only did it need to be beautiful, but analytic design. And that is the design that is designed to reduce stress, the, the human side of that. Because when you have a reduced stress within a person, they are much uh, more able to heal and recover. And then it had to be economic to fabricate. Next slide. So in an, within our own design challenges, we found safety. The timing was almost ridiculous because we were in the middle of the Ebola crisis at the time and it had to be re reliable and uh, the size was critical to fit in its shipping pathways. And the waste mitigation was quite creative and was something that we worked with the um, engineers on. And then the human-centric piece, both the human factors and the psychosocial psycho factors were equally as important. And then, of course, the workflow protocol. Next slide. So the, the protocol was fairly simple in the treatment. Um, it, the treatment required uh, IVs, it required oxygen therapy, um, and it required medications for, um, to deal with the, um, the infection. And then other issues as they might have occurred in individuals. But, so the treatment was fairly simple, but the process of delivering it became quite complicated. Next slide. And some of the complications were based on the PPE that we've heard a lot about. But for Ebola, this was uh, these suits. They, there was a jumpsuit with a hood, and there were gloves, and there were boots, and then there were, um, and, and they were hot, they were um, heavy, and um, they were just awkward and clumsy. And then just moving through the capsule in these suits, and then 
any part of the suits became contaminated and the whole waste management issue of the contamination became quite complex. Next slide. Okay, through the design process, and um, I, I wanted to mention there, there were really three main players, our firm and um, MedStar Research, who we also um, did the ER1 project with, and I have been involved in several of the research projects with them. And Evans and & Paul, which is a solid surface manufacturer, a fabricator, and their engineering department. And they were the ones that first brought this subject up to our team and MedStar Research because they had worked very closely to solve a lot of the problems we had in um, MedStar's ER1. So that's why they were involved. Next slide. I, wa I wanted to go through this a little bit and I don't have the pointer, but um, uh, if I can kind of walk you through this process, because this is, this is kind of one of our, our interim uh, work sessions where we talked about the flow of how the um, clinicians went through and they service the patient, how, uh, uh, which areas were warm, which areas were hot, meaning the infectious level and how we would handle waste containment that ended up going through the floor. And each one of the modular sections you see here, the waste went through the floor and was not carried out. So that helped with any cross contamination. And then the sizing was in flux for a great deal of the time, constantly um, varying the requirements of the clinical protocol and the proxmetics with the people that are involved in it, as well as keeping it within the size that will fit at work as a modular, can break apart and fit into a, a container. Next slide. So this was, this was basically the sizing that we ended up with. We ended up with uh, the possibility of three or four modules. The, um, the module of the patient bed with the patient toilet became one and um, then the the uh, two ante rooms became one and then ultimately they became two so there was more flexibility to them next slide so here you can see this in, uh, in 3d how this worked and the doors were um, went through, you entered from the end and the, you went through each one of the doors. And you can see the thicker base. This was where the waste were um, from each one of the sec sections were um, um, evacuated through the floor. Next slide. And then this is, we started to look at where we could break them apart. Um, and um, so we had, at first we had the, uh, uh, the, the just two, and then you can see now we have three. Next slide. Okay, there you can see how they break apart and the ends break apart as well. Next slide. And this is, um, the uh, original design concept. And since everything was solid surface, the floor was a poured rubber floor, but the solid surface is a wonderful plastic-like uh, material that you can get to be totally seamless. So the, the doors were seamlessly uh, welded in, the, the graphics in the wall, the design was all sealed, it was um, all part, of every, every surface was um, a solid surface and um, so it was all seamless and the sinks were seamless. We even designed a toilet that was made of solid surface. It's, the picture doesn't show that, but that's um, what it was. So this was our modular prototype and we had at least three and sometimes four components to it. Next slide. So we now 
to think about the um, human centric needs. We know um, social isolation is a huge part of, of treating these um, pandemics and it also impacts the, the patient so much because often as they move into the, the serious part of the, the disease or are in uh, the late stages of dying, that they no longer can um, contact or touch the hand or see the face or um, hear the voice of, of this. We work very hard. How do we handle social isolation? Um, and, I, you know, next slide. The next slide shows we just um, we added a window on the on the front and a, 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 a where it, with a voice communication that we could talk through to the patient. But the patients are so highly contagious that we can't have human contact. Um, so that um, we we know it's an issue. We know it's part of the. Um, need for the patient to recover, but uh, we have not resolved that, I don't feel, in sufficient manner, much like today's pandemic. Next slide. So the next steps we're going through, um, once we designed the, the prototype, it went to engineering um, to create a full mock-up. We cost analysis, had patient input observational studies and the final one was a field test but we never got to the next steps next slide um, the next steps uh, were the, the or the project became abandoned next slide <clears throat> and abandoned it was abandoned abandoned for one good reason, it was the African countries really were successful at mitigating um, the Ebola um, and the project lost funding. And there was a lot of, well, who needs it? There's, you know, we handle the flu and the measles and other epidemics. Um, okay. So, um, so it was shelved and all the, um, the learning and the experience that we learned from this and the research that we gained from this. So it was all shelved. And now the next contagious disease was born that we're right in the middle of today. Um, so it's kind of interesting to go back and, and look at this project uh, that we designed in 14. It says, okay, a bowl is gone. We don't need it. We don't need to think about epidemics anymore. Next slide. But then we know COVID-19 came along and we know it's, it's different um, than the Ebola um, and it spread a lot differently. Um, COVID is an airborne um, um, virus and it gets caught up in the, the particles and the droplets and becomes part of our air quality uh, very quickly and spreads um, through our, our air system. And the Ebola drops off much quicker and the Ebola is primarily transmitted through bodily fluids. Um, so we're, and we're still learning about COVID-19. Next slide. And I'm not really gonna talk about the design for COVID, but the parallels are are serious and I think we should talk about them. We're, we're understanding, we're getting more and more information about how the virus is spread, how far it goes, um, and we're still learning. We're still learning a lot about the disease. Next slide. And when we look at healthy buildings and we say, how do we design healthy buildings? And today we have some very good roadmaps. May not be perfect, but they're very good. I've been on the NIH Healthy Building Committee for 12 years, and we've um, looked at all the complexities of what makes a building healthy or safe. And we know today there are no safe buildings. 
we can't go to the theater, we can't go to restaurants, we can't go to ball games, we can't go to the opera because our buildings aren't safe. We're even struggling with our home environments that we once designed this wonderful open plans for everything. And now we're looking for corners to hide in and to shelter in home and place. So we really need to think of, of what makes a building healthy. And it's not just the air quality. It's a big part of it, but it's not just the air quality. Well, well building standard takes 12, or seven major steps or major components of what's a healthy building. And we know air quality and water quality are right up there. But we also know that elements of the mind and the emotion are also there in biophilic design and, and, and nutrition. So it takes a lot to understand um, how healthy our buildings are. But if we are architects and designers and healthcare architects and designers, we have a responsibility to the clients we serve, not only to build a shell and a space and a place, but to ensure that they're healthy and we can live in them. Right now, our safe places are outside. We're having our conference calls outside. And when we're getting together, we're going outside. Why? Because they're healthier than what we've built. Next slide. So as we're learning about um, the COVID and the air quality as just one small component of our, of our healthy buildings, but it's a major component that we don't have under control. This should be a no-brainer. We should be able to figure this out. It took us more than 30 years once we had the evidence to know that a single patient room reduced hospital infections. It took us 30 years to make that mandatory. And, and we know um, nursing homes don't have to comply with this and many other congregate living facilities. We have information that we are not using to stop some of these basic uh, unhealthy practices in our buildings, but we haven't been able to make them happen. And because it's not, not our fault, it is a huge complex issue that involves government and economy and culture and now politics um, to, to make our buildings healthy. But I think we have a major role in it in moving forward. And I hope that this, after this um, experience with COVID, all the great ideas that you all are coming up with to design healthier spaces and places don't wind up on shelves for another 10 years before we can implement them and start doing something with our buildings. Next slide. So is this our new normal that we just have to take our individual selves and find ways of protecting us so that we don't um, acquire these pathogens? Next slide. Or can design thinking provide better outcomes? And I like design thinking because it isn't just about designing space. Design thinking involves the user and thinking about how we design the space and for what purpose. And it's far more than the function that we've defined in the program because human-centric design involves the that those two elements of being human that I talked about, being human and a human being, and they're very different. Next slide. So we, the COVID and viruses, pathogens, measles, the flu, they kill. They kill our loved ones. Some of them um, when I was young, polio was still an epidemic and it killed children. Now the, the, the pandemic is killing our elderly and it attacks us physically. It makes, kills us. It actually 
depletes our life. But COVID also kills, and these viruses and pandemics kill emotionally. Domestic violence is up. Um, crime is up. Uh, emotional depression, alcoholism up, is up. Mental illness is up. It is killing our people. We're, and you don't even hear about that. What we're concentrating is the physical side on how to make these more safe. But if we look at what a healthy building is, and we look at organizations like WELL, and they're dealing with the whole person that uses the building, we're not designing these buildings for machines. We're designing them for very fragile human beings. And we're all fragile. We're fragile because we're physical, and we're fragile because we're emotional. And our buildings and this pandemic affects both sides of those. So we have to remember that psychosocial side of what we're designing and who we're designing for it. And to just have buildings that meet air, better air quality, which is really important, it's not enough. And who can do that better than our healthcare design community? I don't know. I think. I think it's in our hands. I really do. Okay, next, final slide, I think is the next final slide. Yes. So, um, th this, this is funny. I, ha I had this slide photoshopped um, at least five years ago when I was talking about healthy buildings and our healthcare, are our healthcare environments healthy buildings? And I look at it today and it's more appropriate today <laughs> being in the midst of our pandemic and what doctors have to gear up for to treat the patients on dealing. And I think we can do better than this. We've got to do better than this. We've got to use our design thinking and come up with human centric solutions. So um, that's the end of my presentation. and. Um, I, I'm really happy to answer any questions, if I can. <laughs> it's, a, it's a complex subject. <laughs> Jill, I am not able to see, you can, uh, for everyone who's attending, you can either unmute and ask a question or you can text your question. Um, Jill, if you could help with anything that gets texted, that would be great. But does anyone have any questions they would like to First of all, it's an amazing project, Barbara, and it must be, it must be a strange feeling to have done that work and, and to see a need, you know, a dire need for that kind of a design right now. Yes, the irony. Lynn, we did have a question in the chat box. Um, she's curious if COVID-19 has brought up discussions between healthcare clients and designers and the integration of certifications like the well building standard. Uh, hi guys, this is Dushica Stankovic. I, I'm not aware of uh, the um, direct uh, uh, action that has been taken, but I know that the well community is um, studying uh, healthcare environments and uh, is working on uh, uh, different approaches. Right now, they do not have a pilot standard for the healthcare specifically, but it would be, I think, up to us to, um, as a healthcare designers, to uh, to reach out and and try to um, to use their resources and and try to make our projects. Better. I personally am studying the materials right now, and I'm going to take the the well uh, the test. I think next week I have it scheduled. So um, I intend to try and push the the healthcare design uh, issues with, with the uh, well standard community as well. Um, but the question I had was actually our uh, barriers that we have in healthcare design as it pertains to the well. Uh, building or, you know, sustainable design and such. Last week, we had a presentation on the uh, clinical materials uh, and how the, the performance and, um, and financial aspect of, of uh, the specified materials is actually in forefront of the 
of the design decision rather than uh, some of the other factors. Obviously, patient and, and visitor safety is, is uh, uh, far more important than, than, than other aspects that, that come in play, to play uh, with, with uh, sustainable design and, and uh, well standards or fit well for the residential also. So. Yes, th thank you for the question. Uh, I think um, my, my, my personal thought is that well building has taken a really deep dive and you know that's, that's kind of been born out of the lead and the sustainable movement. But um, taking and linking the various components of the built environment to actually the human system and bodily system, the endocrine system, the respiratory system, and so on. And I think that's a, that is an incredible approach. Um, no one else has really done that. It looked at every, the, 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 the function of our bodies at, in, in the term of wellness and well being, and what kind of environmental impacts have on our systems and, and allergies and cancer and heart disease. And so th they have really done the first pass that I, I see as unraveling the complexities of what makes a building healthy. And it really is a first pass at it because the more you know about it, the more complicated it becomes. And um, but I think it's a great, great place that should be like bottom line, we should be designing to this standard. Last June, I opened um, a project we designed, uh, it was a senior living campus, a CCRC. And um, we designed it to well and uh, the uh, assisted living component was designed to a uh, well gold standard and we got it certified. So it's the first senior living facility to be certified well. And through this pandemic, there has not been a single case of COVID. Wow. We know how, how um, tough COVID has been on our senior living environments. And, and it's, you know, I think a lot of it is the air quality because the air quality requirements in, um, in uh, well are greater than what we have in hospitals. So um, not the ICU, I think it's equivalent to what the ICU is under some codes. But I think we should be thinking like this. Um, also, the, a lot of the things we're reading today, and I know we're gonna be thinking and rethinking these things over and over as we get more and more information. But the role of nature and how the air quality of nature and sunlight and um, th that how you can be in these environments that are safe. And yet there isn't a human building that we have designed that's safe from this. So I think we sure got a lot of work ahead of us <laughs> in figuring out, but I do believe well and um, the other initiatives um, are a good start for creating some standards and guidelines that at least we we have some place to start and, um, and make it. And, and what I, the, one of the other resources that I would encourage folks to take, too, that I would encourage folks to take a look at related to air quality and the impact on the spread of infectious disease, um, ASHRAE has uh, assembled a team of experts and they've recently published a position paper uh, if you're not able to easily find that on their site, you can email me and I'd be happy to send you the link. And then secondly, uh, the Knowledge Repository on the center's site. They, the researchers have compiled all of the latest research uh, as it relates to air quality. And some of those studies are actually still in peer review, but they've uh, published them on the Knowledge Repository you know, because of the urgency of getting the information out there. Um, the other thing, Barbara, that I I actually learned, um, and Jen, if, I hate to interrupt. Would you mind stop sharing your screen, and then maybe we can all see each other? Might be. Oh. 
Um, you know, just, just the fact that on average, um, we as human beings spend more than 90% of our time in buildings. And so that just underscores the importance of understanding, you know, the role of our built environment and our health. Those are really great resources. Thank you for sharing, Lynn. There's, and I, I just know just from talking to colleagues that people have some amazing thoughts on this and things we can, that's low hanging fruit that we can do right now to make a difference and some of the creative solutions people are coming up with. So I think now's the time to really stay connected to our, our colleagues and listen to what people are saying because we're all finding ways of, of dealing with these complexities of the environment. And the, and the psychological environments are just as important. Their divorces are springing up, separations, alcoholism. Um, these are real, real parts of this COVID virus that are just as critical as, as hand washing. How do we care for these people that are going, how do you, how do you have school and home and with children and parents that are working all in a, a two bedroom or three bedroom home? You know, how do you do it? And not, and not lose your mind or pick up an, seven cans of beer or whatever. Um, these are, are realities that are really as important in, in addressing this as the air quality, because it's just as deadly. We do have a number of additional questions. And so is it okay to move to some of those? I did. Ah, we have a number of additional questions. So I thought I would read those to you. Great. Okay. Um, and, and then one other resource comes to mind if folks haven't checked it out. The FGI guidelines, I know, has assembled a group of experts, uh, a number of task forces to specifically look at um, all, all emergencies and the role of the built environment and, um, you know, COVID being, of course, at the forefront of that at the moment. Okay, can you explain again where the doffing takes place, is meant to take place in your model? Uh, where the project, yes, for the project was the donning and doffing conducted in the same ante room. I, I tried to, you're a little muffled. The, the what piece? Can you explain where the doffing takes place or is meant to take place? Oh. Uh, is the donning and doffing conducted in yes, the yes. Yes. outside of the module? Okay. Not, right. not, not in the capsule at all. Okay, thank you. Um, we, we had a lot of discussion about that, even to the point of adding another component on it. But um, that, that, uh, ultimately, that's what we agreed on. Okay, and Lori, if you have any, uh, thanks for asking the question, Lori, if you have a follow up. Uh, feel free to either unmute or, or type in another question. Uh, next question. What did you learn from the Ebola pod, either about safe doffing and donning or about material selection that is most useful for designing for general pandemics? Mm. Well, it's, it, it's so many things. Probably the material, the solid surface is really a creative material that you can get. Um, some wonderful seamless effects that are not only seamless that easy to clean, but it also um, uh, it, it, well the maintenance and the easy to clean is really one of its benefits. Um, so that was important, but we had already learned that pretty much with the ER one. The new one was um, the PPE and the how how that affects the design and the mobility of the caregivers, um, the clinicians to care for the patient, I think is, uh, you know, it, very, very difficult. It was a, a major challenge to the design, but it is also a major challenge to the clinicians who have to prepare care 
in this. And also the protocol and how they remove something, how they take something so that if they, you know, and discard something and discard the waste and not taking it through the capsule again. So it, the, um, the, that was a, a, a really learning experience. Probably the biggest thing that we learned from it was really waste management and how critical that is in designing an infectious disease environment and getting rid of all of those those elements and not bringing it across you know today we see gloves being put on at the beginning and never taken off till the end of the day and they just keep bringing that through the environment which is hard to keep clean then so and, and you, you were saying in your model, there's a way to put the waste stream into the floor? Yes. Yeah. So that, that's pretty interesting. I mean, that's a pretty innovative, I, I haven't ever heard of that. Yeah. Um, there, there were um, to be drains of the, the, and that goes into each one of the segments. And then part of the floor actually lifted up that you could put in um, you know, soiled linens and um, other waste directly in it that didn't fit through the drain that were more, um, oh. but yes, that went through. That, that sounds like a wonderful solution. Um, this is from Doug King. How might the element of the human impact be integrated into the current and ongoing work that the FGI work groups is addressing uh, for emergency response? Doug, do you have something more specific? Because I, I think that's a really big question. Uh, there, <laughs> Doug, I don't know Doug, where to start with that one. <laughs> Doug is participating. Well, no, I was, I was uh, knowing, knowing who's involved in the committee um, and, and such, maybe campaigning for Barbara to be on the committee here. I if agree. Having a role somewhere down the road, if, if you know anybody in, in high places. <laughs> I, I, I think, uh, Barbara, yes, getting you on the FGI Special Task Force would certainly be very relevant. Barbara, uh, loaded question, by the way, so that's okay. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> thank you, Doug. Okay, here's, here's a great question, and um, this is from Hugh Campbell. HOK is in the midst of planning a very large hospital in Hong Kong. Hong Kong ran into COVID a little earlier than the U.S. and has a long experience with pandemics. We are revisiting many design elements, but our fear is that our response to this wartime virus will leave much of the hospital unusable during peacetime. Just like Ebola, COVID will go away someday. Well, can't wait for that. Uh, but how do we avoid too many negative pressure isolation units or isolation procedure areas that are difficult to use for normal cases? My fear is also that we are designing out the human factors in our response. We have been through this with AIDS, SARS, swine flu, Ebola, et cetera. What, what are your feelings on that, Barbara? <laughs> That's a, another really big question. I, 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 I don't have an answer for that. I have some thoughts. Um, and probably with uh, ER1, that was a major concern for them to be able to flex yeah. from an emergent contingent situation like an act of terrorism because they treated a lot of the, well, they were the main hospital that treated the Pentagon burn victims from 9-11 and also the anthrax that followed. So um, their, their concern was how do you flex from being an emergency room for an urban area to be the, emergency epicenter for, you know, a contingent situation. There were a lot of scenarios they went through, we went through in talking about that. Um, and it was probably a, a, more than a year's conversation that, so it is not a simple answer. Um, but uh, I think some of the things we're designing the thinking and it's it we have to get into a different level of thinking rather than design sometimes i think we are are encumbered by 
all of our design tools we have and all of our knowledge that we have about how things should be designed and details. We've used this detail before, we're gonna use it again. And I think that's, that's part of our, our problem that we need to really get over. We, get a, we talk about getting out of the box, but we really have to get out of the box. And we have to leave a lot of our tools in that box because when the design thinking that went into universal rooms um, today has been very effective for treating COVID because as they're running out of ICU rooms and they have a universal room, they can treat COVID in those universal rooms. I, is it cheap? No, it's far more expensive to design that way. But just like going to the arguments we had going to a, a single room, I think we really have to weigh the cost of what is an epidemic costing hospitals. And we know before COVID, hospitals had a whole bunch of plans on their docket that they were gonna do. They've all been shelved because they are losing money. Their, um, their the cases that, that they make money on, the electric surgeries are being canceled. Nobody wants to go into these hospitals. Um, I, I think it's a, a bigger problem than just us as well. And we have to reach out and understand um, how um, the cultural needs, like in Hong Kong, um, I'm working with the um, government in Taiwan right now who, um, who had a very different outcome with this pandemic. But what we're working on and trying to solve is senior living problems because they didn't design the infrastructure on building nursing homes. So they have, because the, uh, the family is their caregiver and took care of them. But now the family's moved on, the families are smaller, they don't have people to take care of their senior loved ones. So we're looking at how do you create models and villages, the small house model and concepts in Taiwan. So th the culture of Hong Kong being a Chinese culture as well, is different than our own and how they respond to things. And they've been wearing masks during flu season forever, it seems like, <laughs> not forever, but a long time. So there's a lot we can learn from them culturally before we can really even attempt to solve their problems for hospitals and flexibility. But it is a very worthy conversation. But the more we can understand about their needs and both the needs of their, their, the people that are using these environment from the clinician side to the patient side and family side has to be all part of the equation, not a simple answer. It no. just, and, and I think the biggest caution in designing for this is not applying rules we've used before because we have found, and if this pandemic has shown us nothing else we have not been building our buildings right. We have not been building them healthy. And even things we know that we can't do because it costs too much are some of the very things that would be saving us a lot more money than we're spending on this um, economic disaster this pandemic is creating. So, uh, thank you. No, that's a wonderful, thoughtful response and a lot to think about for all of us. Um, and Hugh, thank you for the question. We're, we're running up. I think we've got a lot of follow-up topics here, Barbara. Um, we'd love to have you back to talk more about your project in Taiwan at some point. Um, is, is information available on the senior living community that you spoke about? Is it publicly available somewhere? Have you published anything? I'm I'm working on it. Um, of last year, I was there several times. This year, all of our meetings were canceled, and so they're not. I'm not going back till next year. I'm in the process of putting them in a book for them. They, the um, that will be translated into Chinese. Um, so, but it's not readily available. I can share at this moment. I can just talk. Maybe about maybe that's a future presentation. Yes, a future presentation. <laughs> We'd love to. 
So I, I think, um, does anyone have any final questions? We're at, almost at the top of the hour. Uh, I'm sure we've got a lot to think about here. Um, Barbara, it's just been such a pleasure and an honor to have you share your knowledge and your insights with us. Um, I'll close by saying thank you to all of you for the wonderful work that you all do to improve healthcare. And thank you for supporting the work and the research of the center. Uh, we really are honored to have you as part of our membership community. And we look forward to connecting with you again very soon. Be well, everyone. Have a great day. Bye, Barbara. Bye, Thanks. Thanks. Thank you all. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you. Thank you. It was great. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you so much. Thanks, Barbara. Really profile. Great to see you, Barbara.